that was a great thing for Facebook. And of course, a lot of people were not able to go out to, you know, physical stores here and there, spending a lot of time at home quarantine. So they're spending more time in time on their phones, on mobiles. So again, conversion rates increased. Hi, this is Ariel Ben Solomon. We're here with a new Ecom Hunt video. This time we're here with one of the top influencers. We are privileged to have the Beast of Ecom with us for one of our first videos featuring top influencers in the dropshipping niche. And we just want to uh, welcome him here. And maybe you could say a few words about yourself, you know, how you got into the whole thing and uh, just introduce yourself to our audience. Pleasure to jump on here and, and have this chat with yourself and the rest of the Ecom Hunt team kind of used the platform for a long time and had success with it. So, you know, it's a pleasure to, to jump on. But yeah, for anyone who don't know who I am, my name is Harry Coleman. I go by the name of uh, The Beast of Ecom, which is my YouTube channel. I run a lot of dropshipping stores and a few smaller brands as well. So I started off kind of dropshipping, <coughs> venturing into the branding route. And I've been doing that for four years now. Previously, I was just working nine to five jobs. Like anyone kind of always wanted to either be it was either a footballer or a business owner. And I got to university and the football thing kind of dropped off a cliff. So the next thing that I wanted to do was being a business owner, but I didn't kind of know what I wanted to do. And then I stumbled across dropshipping and the rest, as you could say, is kind of history. Wow, that's cool. And, and for all of you out there that have never heard of the Beast of Evcom, make sure you check out his uh, YouTube channel. It's a must see if you're in the niche. And he's got a course, he's got a lot of knowledge. And he's always dropping the uh, the value bombs. I think is that how, how you say yes. it? Yeah, that's that's how I usually say it, the value bombs. So uh, that's kind of like my, I don't know what you want to call it, a uh, strap line or, or, you know, something like It's kind of like when you hear value bombs, then, you know, the, the aim was it people to think about the channel. And so, yes, yeah, a lot of people do say it. So let's start with a question. that This one's from Mordecai. He always likes this one. And this is, if you had to start from zero today, what would you do differently? Uh, is there anything you do to kind of fast track your success? Yeah. So if I started from zero with the knowledge that I had now, what I would do is, again, when it comes to explaining to people what, because a lot of people always ask me, you know, what's the best kind of store to get up and running? Now, I always say, okay, it's based on the experience that you have. So if I had the experience that I have, I would start out with a niche dropshipping store or maybe a one product store. But there's some people who are out there who are thinking, you know, what are the best stores to start with as a complete new beginner? Then I would definitely recommend going down the general store route. If, of course, you don't know which niche you want to jump into as well. That's the only reason why I'd recommend a general store. But with the experience that I have, or if you know what niche you want to get into, then I recommend you going down the niche store route. Or very last, I would say the one product store route, only because what a lot of new people do they think that one product store is a good thing to do. And they build this whole store around this one product. They buy the domain name, they get the logo to match and all these kind of things. And the product don't work out. And then what happens is they have to go back to the drawing board, create everything again. Whereas if you just had a niche store, then you can literally just whack up a new product page and then you're good to go test the things out. So I would start a niche store and I would make sure that obviously I always had access to at least one or two products software just so that I can really quickly you know bounce ideas because that's one of the main things about using those is getting ideas to find out what's winning at the moment in time they help you have ideas as well so you may look at our products and think hey you know I've never thought of something like that would be winning and then go down a rabbit hole that way it just goes to a case of just testing our products then a lot of things that I did previously before was I got emotionally attached to a lot of products quite a few new people do when you don't understand what works and what doesn't. So I would definitely, of course, just rapidly test, but I'm easy now. I know instantly if something's going to work or if it isn't going to work just by purely looking at the data, which I didn't know before. So that's one of the biggest keys and takeaways is make sure you learn the data as well. Now, a lot of people are always talking about, well, what's the minimum I can start with? What's, you know, what's the least amount I can start with? And this question, I feel it's been overdone. Everyone's saying, oh, okay, I start with $100, $500. What about the other people out there that a lot of people don't talk about? They have money, they want to start, and, you know, maybe they can buy a course, you know, they have a few thousand dollars to play with, you know? Mm -hmm. How would you tell those people maybe to, you know, speed it up? Yeah, maybe. so, I mean, I don't want to preach uh, buying courses. I don't want to preach, yeah. you know, mentorship or anything like that. 
me myself, I'm personally self-taught. But with that being said, I've lost a lot of money. I have to get to where I am now. Previously, when I wasn't profitable four years ago, spending, you know, because I was working nine to fives and that's how I got my money in, you know, just getting paid a regular $1,500 a month and then using some of that to my Facebook adverts and testing out stuff. Whereas if you start out with like a bulk bit of money, then what you can do is the only way to get access to fast track is to basically either pay with experience with your time or with your money. It's as simple as that. They're the only two things you can pay for experience. Me, of course, I spent pay with it with obviously money and time because I had to learn everything myself. I was in the groups, you know, here and there trying to jump on these free webinars where people would preach a course at the end of it. But if you want to get access to, you know, what works and what doesn't, then I recommend if you've got the money to do so, then yeah, you know, feel free to get yourself a course and it will fast tech you to not make the mistakes that 99% of new people who come into the game make. And that's one of the reasons why I have a course and why I put it out is because, again, there's a lot of mistakes that I made and a lot of mistakes that new people still make to this day, which are just easily, you can just overcome them. And, and again, like you say, you either pay with it with experience, with money mm. or time. Yeah, definitely. The big things about saving time is, you know, outsourcing a lot of that stuff, like even the video making, all that stuff that, so yeah. now what would you say about the, the whole COVID thing? Is that, is that rattled you? I mean, I noticed that your stores are still very successful. So the COVID kind of situation has helped e-commerce. I think I read the other day somewhere where you know, the growth that is happening at this moment in time wasn't expected until, you know, 2030 or something along that line. Yeah. So in the kind of like the March period, everything whereby a lot of the businesses were slashing spend on advertising, all these big companies, what happened was we were getting dirt cheap traffic on Facebook, which, you know, you generally don't really see that on Facebook because year on year, it's always increasing. So that was a great thing for Facebook. And of course, a lot of people were not able to go out to, you know, physical stores here and there, spending a lot of time at home quarantine. So they're spending more time in time on their phones, on mobiles. So again, conversion rates increased. However, from a dropshipping standpoint, what happened was with the whole COVID situation when it started in China, dropshipping from China, we had the problems of logistics. So basically what was happening was the cost to ship stuff from China was just going through the roof. So at the mm. other day, my agent would message me saying, you know, we've got to put the prices up $2. And it comes to the point where, you know, certain products that were being sold, we just had to stop the adverts because they were just no longer profitable. So it was a balancing act. And now at the moment in time, things have come back down the other end. So prices have come back down. People haven't gone back to how it was pre-COVID. So people mm. are still a little bit wary of wearing masks and not going out, not socializing, yeah. clubs are still shut. So we're still getting the added benefit of this COVID period. So all in all, it's been a good thing. People are thinking about maybe using agents, maybe going through third-party services, you know, like CJ, dropshipping, all these things, or using a warehouse in the US. Or are you still thinking there's enough space to keep having success in uh, using uh, AliExpress and Chinese products? There is if you're just starting out to test and get things running up and running to start with. All of the products that I sell at scale, you have to use an agent of some sort. You know, they have to buy on your behalf to then be able to ship it out. So what I always say to people is what AliExpress allows you to do or any sort of place whereby you just want to kind of drop ship things. Again, I've used eBay before previously and testing out an Etsy supplier now at the moment in time is just to start off and validate whether or not the product's going to work for you then feel mm -hmm. free to use those. Once you start getting to the point whereby you're getting some traction, then what you want to do is you then want to start to think about, okay, you don't want to be doing 100 orders through AliExpress per day. You know, you don't want to be doing 150 <laughs> because you don't have any relationship with the supplier, essentially, because mm -hmm. it's all through there, you know, mm -hmm. and you don't know what their stock situation is, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that's why once you get it to about, you know, from 25 to 30 orders per day consistently on a product, then start to think about, you know, getting an agent, letting them buy on behalf of the manufacturer, getting better shipper rates, prices, and those kind of things. And, and it just helps the overall customer service. So that's interesting. So you're saying test out the products for sure. AliExpress, no problem. But you got to shift off that once you start getting to the larger. You got to, yeah. As soon as you start getting some traction, you want to shift off because it's going to allow for you for better scale. Okay, now let's switch a little bit to the product Ecom Hunt. How have you used it in the past? How would you recommend some... Uh, beginners or whatever to use. The, I mean, some people say, you know, you can go look to the old products on Ecom Hunt or I don't know, some people have different ways of using it. How would you say? 
Yeah, so, I mean, I've been using it for a long, long time. If I'm being 100% honest, I wouldn't jump on this podcast if I'd never used it before and never had success with it because I'm, I'm the type of person whereby if anyone watches my content or anything like that will, will know that I'm not here just to make a book out of promoting some sort of you know service, essentially. So I only recommend stuff that I've used and had results from because if not, it's, it's invalid. So again, I've been using it for a long time and I generally just pop on there here and again because obviously I've got different methods of how I find yeah. products or, you know, here and there, all sorts of different ones, et cetera. But what I usually do is I just like to pop on and have a look at the newest first and foremost as a quick scroll through. Yeah. And then what I always like to do is any sort of niche which I'm actively selling in or I have previously sold in before, then I've thought yeah. around those. Another thing that you can do, which I do now and again, is again, go back to the old products. And what you generally find sometimes, a lot of people always talk about saturation, saturation, yeah. etc. Now, there are some products which are saturated, which again, you're not going to get the best results if you start selling it out now. However, you can always make an old product work if you are good at marketing and you can find a specific angle to be able to sell it to people. So they're kind of the methods that I like to do is go through and just see if I can sell a, you know, an older product to a, a different market, if that makes sense. Or get a better video or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, better product that's I noticed in one of your last videos, you had a whole thing on, I think it was one of your last videos, on Google. You, you had a big success on uh, Google. Google Ads, Google Shopping, I think it was. What would you recommend in terms of using Google? In terms of, I mean, just when you're starting out. I mean, of course, when you're testing, maybe you don't want to go on Google. But once you find a winner, then you'd switch right away and listen and syncing your feed there and all that? Or? My bread and butter is Facebook. But I like to use Google as to supplement, essentially, to mm-hmm. add in, you know, additional revenue. Because again, Facebook and Google are two different platforms in terms of they're the biggest out there and the two most used out there. But they're different in the way you advertise on them. Whereas Facebook is a lot more creative. You have to come up with videos. You're doing interruption marketing. You're trying to stop the scroll, etc. Those kind of things. And with Google, you very much don't have to be creative at all. You know, people are searching for your stuff. It's all about text. It's all about you know, showing up at the right time. You don't have to be a creative person at all to use Google. So they're two completely different platforms. I like to start on Facebook all of the time because, again, that, that's my bread and butter. That's where I have most of my yeah. success for. But then once you've kind of got a product which is winning, then, yeah, you can potentially test out it on Google. And I always recommend just having, like, an overarching Google campaign where you just, like, a pull campaign where it just pulls in all of your products. And you might find that some of them, make it start to get some sales which you can then scale further one final thing with google ads the easiest quick win that you can get on google is if you've got a website which is having traffic is just set up what i like to call a brand campaign which is basically just a google search campaign just for your store name and literally it it just prints money in the the grass is insane that's interesting that's the first time i've heard that one that's interesting another thing that you talked about recently on your channel you talk about gem pages using gem pages and using some, it was like Zipify versus gem pages. And then if you're adding on these like, you know, product page builders to help improve the conversions, how do you see that improving conversions? I mean, is it worth it? Or It's something that you can split test. Something that I had success with, with two products earlier pre-COVID. I've switched most of the products back. Well, not the ones that were selling, but most of the products now are just on product pages, normal product pages, but you very much want to just test out. And I think it depends on the type of product that you're selling, because uh, if you're selling a product which needs a lot of convincing uh, or a lot of, you know, benefit driven points, there's limited things you can do to a product page on Shopify. Obviously it's dependent upon your theme. And also right. it's very much, if you do want to get those things built in, then what will happen is you have to pay for a developer and pay an arm and a leg to get things done. And if you want things changed, and again, it's going to cost you consistently. Whereas if you're using gem pages, then you can pretty much just do things on the fly on your own, you know, very easy, very intuitive. So again, it's one of those things whereby you would test it out. But what I will say is that if your product doesn't convert on a product page, normal product page, chances are gem pages isn't just going to turn, you know, shit into gold, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. We're talking about suppliers, how you deal with the AliExpress. Do you evaluate them in a certain way? Like if they're reliable, how quickly they respond to you? When you reach out to like AliExpress suppliers, if they don't respond to you in like 24 hours, do you kind of just drop them or is there some criteria you use a little bit? 
Yeah, so I'd say criteria. I don't pretty much, you know, email them questions most of the time because in AliExpress, the messaging system is so broken that it's a minefield whereby, you know, if you place an order and don't buy it, what will happen is you'll get messages and it's just hard to, so I, I don't, you know, I can't, can't bother to do all that jazz. So basically, my criteria pretty much is I always like to look and I always have to have a, a rating of 95% and upwards to use them, okay? And you can check that. And also what I like to do is make sure that they've been in business for, uh, you know, at least two years, three years. The more years that they've been on AliExpress, the better. Some of them have like a top rated star thing as well. That um, means that they've been on there for a long I time. See. What you're trying to avoid is finding suppliers which have, again, less than 95%. Also, people who have literally just started their AliExpress stores, you know, like two months ago. Then you kind of left, you know, you don't know if they're going to supply you or, or not. The final thing would be, of course, to make sure that you do your due diligence on the actual product itself. So you want to be making sure that you have a look at some of the comments as well. If some of the comments, of course, and this is probably more about the product than the supplier, but you want to make sure that, of course, that the product reviews are ones that are positive. It arrived. Sometimes they post pictures of the products, etc. And just doing those kind of things is what I generally like to look for. Okay, last question. This was in your last video, I think, actually about CBO testing and CBO ads on the Facebook ads. If you're going to use CBO, you're not going to use CBO. And in your last video, I think you didn't use CBO at all. You used the, the old method, right? And then maybe just say something about that, what you think. You can use both tests, maybe test both, you'd say? Or? Yeah, for that specific product and that specific campaign, I was doing ABO. At the minute, I've got something which is working insanely well with CBO. So what I will say, the main thing for me to start with is I was always test with ABO. Now that Facebook have said that they're not going to force people into doing CBO, it just gives you way more control to be able to make a standard test out of things and just very much then gauge that, okay, every single one's going to get spend. And you can do it with CBO, but it just means that you've got to set min and max spends and yeah, yeah. it's just a pain in the ass. If you turn something off, it rocks the whole CBO. So with testing, I'm very much all about ABO. Always use ABO to start with. Scaling, nine times out of 10, I'll go to CBO. But in that period of time, August was not a great month for a lot of people anyway, nearly years for e-commerce wise. But again, it's something that you want to test out. If your CBOs are not performing great, test out ABOs at the same kind of budget. And again, what it will do is it will give you the ability to turn off ad sets without having a knock-on effect of the other ones, which can happen with CBOs when you turn off ad sets. So ABO to test and CBO to scale. If CBO doesn't work, you want to test something else out, try ABO. Great. That's some great, great information. Some value bombs. Ecom Beats just drops with us. So you guys definitely check out his channel. We'll uh, hopefully have you again on in you know, a few months down the line as, as our channel grows as well. And uh, thanks yeah. a lot for being with us. Yeah, man, I appreciate it. Again, if anyone wants to follow me, go hit me up. My Instagram will be somewhere, Beast of Ecom UK. Check out my channel, Beast of Ecom. If you do want to learn more and take things forward, then check out Ecom Beast 2.0, my course. But I appreciate you, uh, you having me on for this. And hopefully, the guys got some value from this as well. Great. Thanks a lot.